Thank you so much for joining us today on my show called Inspired Blessings with Jean Marie Prince. And I want to thank my guest, Pastor Scott Kraniak. Did thank I you. say that correctly? That's correct. Good. Very good. <laughs> okay. And I want to thank him so much for joining us today. And so, Pastor Scott, I always like to give a little background of uh, my guest and how, you know, they got the opportunity to be uh, on my show. Um, what I did was, of course, we know social media is big. So, um, being the fact that I have a, um, a an Inspired Blessings Facebook page, and by the way, if you could like it, was you know really kind enough to actually message me that he'd be interested in telling me about who he is, his story, as well as about his book, and um, and and with his book, the uh, the topic basically is is a topic sometimes we can shy away from, maybe be a little bit embarrassed, things like that, but sometimes it really is a topic that needs to be addressed. Amen. Okay? And the book is called Spiritual Living in a Sexual World. And um, so basically what I'd like to do is, of course, you know, with all my guests, is to have a conversation. Give me an example of a little bit of your background and of who you are before you became actually a pastor. And we always an example that somebody would want to follow. Yeah. Well, I was definitely not an example that somebody would want to follow, and if anybody would have told me that I would have been uh, a pastor, let, al you know, let alone a Christian, I mean, uh, they would, uh, I would have thought it was crazy because uh, I was, you know, grew up in, you know, 70s, 80s, you know, long hair, played drums in a rock and roll band, drugs and all that stuff, so that was, you know, turning to Christ was the last thing. I was atheist, didn't believe in anything, so. I know that when we were talking and I was kind of learning a little bit more about your story, how you used to tell me that you were such an atheist, but yet you didn't realize, but you were actually worshiping another god. Yeah. yeah. Okay? That you would actually, what, paint your room? Yeah, well, yep, I had, I mean, I'm famous for painting my room black, and I had uh, 666 painted on the wall, and I had an altar with skulls, and I got involved in the occult, and I you know, thought it was a cool thing at the time, and, uh, you know, I stayed with that for quite a while in those teenage years until my uh, mid-20. Uh, what did your parents think when uh, you saw they, that? They thought it was a phase, you know, well, he'll grow out of it. You know, if we, uh, you know, I didn't grow up in a believing home, so they didn't know the dangers of playing with those things. So they just figured it was a, a phase and, you know, and he'll grow out of it. Right. But when did you start believing? Uh, I think it was around 1983. Uh, I know uh, precisely it was 1983 that I, I heard the gospel on, it was actually on TV. I heard a, a preacher on TV, I actually think it was 700 Club, and uh, I heard it and, uh, you know, I was in a time where I was searching, not happy, uh, and I figured, well, I have nothing to lose. Let's give Christ a try. So right. I bowed my knee to Christ. Uh, I think it was like April of uh, 1983, and uh, from that point on, it wasn't a radical conversion, but from that point on, things really began to change for me. And so, let's say prior to that, did you have a trial that you actually like a, a, a trial that you could say that this was? Um, no, other than money? other than just being, uh, you know, lonely, uh, you know, uh, working all week and then spending all my money on partying and drugs on the weekend and then sleeping all Sunday and doing it again. It became you know, just, uh, you know, is this, uh, is this what life is? You just work all week, spend all your money on partying and then you're hung over for the, you know, for yeah. Sunday. And, and yeah, so it was a routine and I just said, there has to be more. Right. I know there has to be more. Yeah, I know a lot of people think that way. Yeah. I'm trying to remember though in a conversation whether or not I think you might have mentioned that you might, you tried to commit suicide at Yeah, point. yes. That was uh, actually later on uh, when, uh, after I became a Christian, believe it or not. Okay. Uh, was now why would that be? Uh, well, uh, the Lord was doing a work in me and two times I came to the place of Great Depression, and uh, the Lord uh, used that to get my head to turn because I, I was had a great job, making tons of money, life was going great. But He w was calling me to be a pastor, and I didn't know it. So uh, He showed me that uh, all the money and uh, and position uh, of a good job didn't really give you the joy. I fell into a deep depression, and uh, and that's where God got my attention. So what happened when you made the attempt to commit suicide? Well. Uh, I, uh, I wrote a farewell letter to my wife. Uh, I drove uh, off to uh, Smith's Point Park. 
on a January, cold winter's January, I had my Bible and I was just crying and saying, God, I'm just going to, I don't know what I was going to do, mm -hmm. drive into the worship, but I was going to, I was going to end it somehow. Sure. And, uh, and I was waiting for God to uh, give me uh, some kind of, you know, signal. And I looked at my Bible, I, did, I couldn't find anything. And all I heard was an inner voice that said, just go home, go back home, don't do this. I went back home, told my wife what I was going through, and I started to get help after that. Well, yeah, uh, thank God. Yeah, you thank know? God. Because, as we know, sometimes when people commit suicide, you don't know really where you go. Yeah, you know, and that's true. Mm -hmm. um, so when did you feel that you had a calling to serve God? Uh, that was in 1997 when I, had, when I was in that dark depression. Uh, and it was a short time after that that I... Uh, uh, I really felt the call, and after that time is when I actually wrote this book, mm -hmm. and I started to go to school, and I felt the Lord was preparing me. I didn't know what for, but because right. you're going to be doing something bigger than your secular job, right. so get ready. Yes. And as a matter of fact, uh, he woke me up one night, and uh, Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk, uh, chapter one, uh, wherever. Uh, it says that uh, I will show you things that if I if I told you what they were today you would not believe them and that was the one thing that was the turning point in my life I said Lord I don't know what it is but okay I'm gonna keep going keep serving right well you know what God can do amazing things and like I said I mean just me even having this TV show yeah. when, when he's telling me do the book and now we're, you know, I'm having a show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so oh. so it, it's amazing. Your, t your testimony is just, it has yeah. a race car. I'm, uh, besides the pastor of the Center Reach Bible Church, I'm the track chaplain at Riverhead Raceway out in Riverhead. I've been there for close to seven, eight years now. And it's a long story of how I ended up there, but I've always liked cars. And I've always, you know, I want to reach people for Christ. And uh, I always look at some people who are you know, not going to church so much and the people who maybe who are left behind. And mm -hmm. I felt this, you know what, I love cars. Uh, I love the people who are into cars and racing. You know, wouldn't it be great if I could bring, if they can't come to church, how about if I bring church to them? Right. Um, you know, it didn't matter. I knew that it was good. And uh, people have come to Christ through this ministry. Right. We have the car, the car in parades. We have it in car shows. We bring it to schools where I'm a guest speaker. Uh, been to a lot of the Christian schools around here. Uh, people come to Christ through this car. Well, you know what? Just like in the Bible, sometimes is that you have, you know, when you're going to be with unbelievers, you kind of not conform to yeah. what they do, but you know, all, all the way, but just, you know, to breaks kind of the be ice. with them. Yes. It really does. It's a conversation starter. That's the one thing about the car is people are surprised because I have big signs on it. It says Racing with Jesus Ministries. Right, right. And uh, they say, wow, that's, you know, what is that? Right. How do you well, merge the two together? The fact that you actually now tend to join more hot rodders yeah. um, and your, you know, congregation, they're accepting yeah. of that? Yeah, we have a big sign in the church. It says the, uh, we are actually starting to get known as the Racers and Hot Rodders Church. Uh, where we have a picture of the car and we welcome anybody and we've we're starting to gain people from the racetrack race fans car collectors are starting to come and I you know use a lot of that analogy in my sermons talking about cars and racing yeah. and everybody's loved it it's really been a, a great exciting and a blessing and every year it's just more exciting right well yeah because your church being Center Reach um, yeah. Bible Church yeah. and uh, it's um, it's a great church because um, you know I visited you there um, also, you, uh, what is uh, Operation Rusty Jeep? Yeah, Rusty Red Jeep, Rusty and I Red have Jeep. a little thing yes. here. This is a DVD, and this is a really out-of-the-box, crazy idea. It, it's really too hard to go into, but if you want a copy of the, D, the, of the, of where, the DVD. Where, where would they get that? Uh, this is free. We have thousands of these, and uh, they could contact, at the end of the show, we'll give them the uh, web page and the emails, and they can contact me. Uh, for as many as they want, but it's using an object lesson mm -hmm. to bring a point. This is a, a presentation that we put together professionally where we use a rusty old Jeep to show that, you know, uh, something might look good on the, on the outside, mm -hmm. but inside it's rusty. And we bring the gospel message to a, a group of people by using an object that you know you wouldn't think of using and it's this dvd alone has brought Actually, people to christ yes. you saw it yeah yep. yep you did a great job uh, because you know what sometimes 
there are people out there that just want all these fancy words. Yeah, it's, it's simple. It's just simple. It's like a simple, it's like we're having, we're having conversations. Yeah. You're having a conversation as you're cleaning the car and you're explaining, you know, in the fact of what certain things would represent. Yeah, and, and their lives. And Yeah, uh, I think, you know, what do you think the fact that uh, Jesus, you know, would say about that, the way you're presenting it? Well, I, I think he would go to the people and he would use, you know, fishermen knew about fishing gear right. and he would use no he said be fishers of men and they could under understand sure. that they sure. could embrace that sure because uh, it was a natural uh, mm -hmm. trans you know uh, transition for them right by chance or by design human beings have been given the wisdom to design the car but god created the human beings what do you think? Now, as a pastor, you know, we can look at pastors and we always, I think, you know, the congregation tries to think, oh, this, you know, the pastor, he's got to be perfect. There's no sin in his life and things like that. Or are there any secrets yep. that would you uh, consider? Well, that goes back to before I was a pastor, before I was a deacon, elder, anything like that. And that was uh, pornography. Uh, grew up, uh, you know, uh, where that was very acceptable. And uh, as a young boy, uh, all my friends, we had, back then it was just magazines. So what age would you say you started? Oh, probably about 12 years old, 13 years old. Okay. And I was exposed to all that. Uh, and it wasn't a problem until after I became a Christian. And uh, I still had this uh, problem, and I felt this conviction. And I thought I was the only one. I would go to men's meetings as a, just as a new believer, and everybody to me looked like, Oh, these perfect men, they're so godly, but yet I have these thoughts in my head, and so I was afraid to ever bring it up. Uh, and then one day I had a, a men's Bible study. I said, yeah, do any of you guys ever suffer? Or, you know, and they were really hush-hush about it, so I felt, okay, it must be just me. But then after that meeting, men came up privately and says, I suffer with that too. Yeah, because you know what? It's not something that people want to share. Yeah, it's, say a, it's, it's an, an embarrassing, embarrassing It's sure. an embarrassing thing. And you also, don't, yeah, you don't want you know, your family to find out about it as well as you know, other people to look at you a little bit differently yeah. because of it. So the fact that you were courageous enough to really kind of share that and, and to put it out there. So is that why you were inspired to write yeah. your book? It, you know what? I've, I've always... Uh, held true or held on tightly to the scripture uh, where the Lord says that uh, those who will lift themselves up God will bring down and those who humble themselves he'll li lift up so I said you know what if no one's going to talk about this mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about it and this book is basically my experience mm -hmm. as a Christian I was a deacon in the church taking offerings yet right. you know struggling with lusting after the flesh and uh and I, you know, I felt God say, you know what, tell the story, be honest, be brutally honest. Right. And, you know, and I did, and uh, uh, I, it's, it's been a real success. We've got to do uh, speaking seminars at men's groups, at different churches, mm -hmm. uh, homeschool conventions for people raising young teenage boys, um, and it's been a big success. Well, you know, just the title, Spiritual Living in a Sexual World, yeah. how simple can you be, yeah. you know, and it, and it explains. So g can you do me a favor and give me an overview of what the book's about then? Okay, well, the book is about, uh, uh, number one, the dangers of it, mm -hmm. that it isn't no big deal. It is right. a big deal. Right. Jesus says that if you've looked upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart, even right. without any physical contact. Right. So that would always haunt me. And uh, I put the book together where men, this is a danger. This is something very serious. You're never going to be the man of God uh, that he wants you to be. It's going to hurt your family. It's going to hurt your marriage. It's going to hurt your children. And I broke the book down into different segments, one geared towards the wives of, uh, of men who are suffering, how they can help their husbands. Yeah, you know what? I, I think uh, on, on the one hand that uh, a wife uh, dealing with a husband who is into pornography is expecting that wife to be Absolutely, that, absolutely. You know? and, and, and you know what? You know, it's not going to happen, it and is, it's it isn't, and and it's kind of disappointing because of the fact that the wife, you know, may feel like she's trying to perform the best that she can, 
but it's not the best in the husband's eyes because he you and know, looks more be. into more of a sick type of a yeah. of a and and that's a common thing. So I do counsel men for this uh, for this problem, and the wives will always say the same thing: I can never compete with that, and they never should have to. And uh, you know, people often say, "Well, no, that's it, it'll be good for your sex life or for your marriage," but actually, it destroys. It destroys your sex life. It'll destroy your marriage, and you know, the sins of the father go down to the next generation. Right. And I have three boys, and it is something that uh, I have been very frank with them about. And watch out for this. Well, you know what? It makes it hard when the world is it's so basically accepted, yeah. yes, and the world, you know, wants to always about being hot, being sexy, and you know, this is yes. what you, you should expect, and things like that. I just want to hit this. And um, you know, so, so, so it does make it hard um, for the kids that are growing up, because that's what they think, that's their environment. Yeah, yeah. That's what they expect. Yeah, this uh, generation has it so much more difficult than even I did. Uh, it is just so out there and so acceptable that to be a Christian young person who is not a part of that, who doesn't dress that part, you're looked at as from another planet. Right. So it is, I just feel really bad for those young people. So, kind of giving you uh, not, you know, little information from the book though, what are you recommending? Well, I'm, I'm recommending to the men to mm -hmm. really uh, look at this as a very serious thing. The Bible actually says that, you know, when, you know, when we sin, sins of the flesh, it it's actually harms us physically. Right. It's a physical problem and uh, it's uh, s something that you need to deal with. And right. either, uh, you know, you seek someone who you can talk to about it, you need an, an accountability partner, which is what I suggest with a lot of men. Um. How hard was it for your wife to deal with this? Uh, she was great. My wife is great, and I told her many years ago when this became, I said, I have a problem, and I need your help. And, uh, and she has been great with me. She's been very tender and understanding, but, you know, tough when it needs to be tough. And uh, the Lord has blessed us for, you know, for being honest. Yeah. I mean, you must, uh, in a way, be relieved to kind of get it out there now, you know? So oh, yeah, and it's, you know... your congregation... Yeah, I, I, I speak about it in my congregation bluntly. Uh, men, I tell men, I, uh, everybody, and if you go to my church, people know that Pastor Scott almost committed suicide in his life, suffered with depression, suffered with anxiety, suffered with pornography. You know, I'm a basket case, but you know what? God takes the weak things of the world. Oh, sure. And he confounds the, 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 the wisdom of the wise. So, right. Because I'm, I, you know, people would say, man, you're, you're a real mess. I said, yes, I am a mess, but only through the grace of God he uses me. And that's where the trials triumph. Yeah. You know, through the power of, of God in your life. Yeah. Um, you know, and I definitely give you credit for uh, to really be out there and to share this with because really, what you're doing is you're, you're also going to be writing uh, in the process of writing another yeah. book as well. Yep, yeah. uh, my next book is already completed. It's uh, with the publishers and it's going into production. It's actually a two-part set. It's going into production uh, June and July, okay. uh, and that book is really my crowning a jewel that I put a, a lot of work into, and it's. Uh, its title is Depression, Anxiety, and the Child of God, mm -hmm. which again is another taboo. I touch on the taboos because people say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm suffering with depression, and I'm not mm -hmm. supposed to, right? Mm -hmm. And most pastors don't know how to deal with yeah. that. Right, right. Yeah, I guess sometimes being the fact that when you are a pastor or when where you're kind of up there, that people look up to you and that you're supposed to have your act together act in together. your life and things like that, but you know what? We're all human, yeah. you know, yeah. and in the fact that we all need help, and I mean, just even getting this TV show together, you don't know the obstacles that I've come across and things like that, but by God's grace, He's helped me to get to the next phase. Yeah. Stepping out in oh, faith, yeah. yeah. When there yeah. is no step there, you step anyway. Oh, sure, <laughs> and I'm telling you, if I had to write a book about this whole yeah. process, what an interesting oh, You might story want to do it, that. <laughs> that anything, you know, Philippians 4.13, you know, uh, 4.13, I have it hanging right behind the pulpit in my church. It's our theme verse, that I could do all things through Christ that strengthens me, and that means all things. Right. Okay, there's nothing that we can't do if, if God calls us to it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know what it is? is that he does provide the way, even though when you see that obstacle, you're like, oh my goodness, how the heck 
And then, you know, yeah. God provides the way. Amazing people, I mean, just kind of even give you an idea, is the fact that uh, I was having a pro uh, problem with editing, and I needed to get this uh, first show out, and God provided that a gentleman, you know, uh, two hours away, I ended up uh, two days that he helped me to, to be able to. So thank God. Yeah. And one last question. Uh, there are some well-known pastors that are preaching the prosperity gospel instead of the salvation message. Can you tell me the difference between the two and uh, which is more important? Oh, that's, a, that's an easy one for me because, again, you could ask people. I talk about this all the time at church. Um, the prosperity gospel is another gospel. It's no, uh, I am 100% certain it is not found in the Bible. Uh, if it was so, then everyone that became a Christian would be wealthy and well-to-do. If we look at the apostles, <laughs> uh, they, they all ended up, for the most part, dying for Christ. Uh, they lived hard lives. The gospel is that Jesus Christ came and died for sinners. And as the apostle Paul said, Christ came to save sinners, mm -hmm. of whom I am chief. Right. thing that always sticks in my mind when people always say, God has a wonderful plan for your life, according to God. Because uh, if we take that idea and we bring it to the people who were put in the lion's den mm -hmm. who came to Christ, okay, back right. in biblical times, mm -hmm. uh, if you were to tell them they, uh, God has a wonderful plan for your life, yes, and it's going to be that you're going to be eaten by lions, but for the glory of God, <laughs> yeah, right. okay? So God does, does have a wonderful plan, but according to Him, right. that just like that soul surfer girl who had her arm cut off by mm -hmm. a shark. Right. That was part of God's plan to bring more people to Christ. Right. Always the reason. Yes, no, that's true. You know, uh, we can't always expect our life to be perfect on, on earth. Oh, yeah, it's, you know, sometimes it's not. God uses the example. And, and again, I was found two days old in the bathroom. Yeah. And look what he's done. Well, yes. uh, I just wanted to let everybody know, um, if you want to contact me for uh, Christian counseling, I'm a Christian counselor and uh, I do that full time. Uh, depression, anxiety, family, teenage issues. Uh, for all those issues, you can contact me uh, at our webpage, uh, www.cbctruth.com. CBC, for Sandy Beach Bible Church, truth.com. Uh, for information about the book and speaking at your, uh, at your church, uh, you can email me at spiritualivinginthesexualworld at gmail.com. If you'd like information on the book coming out, uh, depression, anxiety, and the child of God, or if you know anybody who's suffering with depression, anxiety, panic attacks, suicidal thoughts, cutting, whatever it is, uh, you could email me at depressionanxietygod at gmail.com, well, and I'll put to, you uh, on my mailing list. Thank you and, uh, for being on my show, and I also want to give you this inspiration oh, wow, for you to hang up. Okay. Yep. And it's just apropos for what we were talking about, and it's called The Meaning of Life. GMarieprince.com and BlessedToInspire.com. We are born into this world with flesh, yet we were created with a soul and spirit as well. That is what makes it difficult for us to choose to live in a world for our own selfish desires or to live in the spirit by focusing on the heavenly things above. We have the prince of the world, Satan, trying to keep the focus on ourselves, yet the Holy Spirit who guides us and lives in us wants us to focus on loving and serving others. That is why we battle within our souls, to choose between right and wrong with the trials that lie ahead of us. When you make choices in the flesh, it may destroy you and others in the process. But when you let the Holy Spirit guide you, He will protect you and keep you from harm. You will be blessed from putting your trust in Him. Living for the desires of our flesh can only offer temporary satisfaction, giving you pleasure today that is gone tomorrow but living in the spirit will have eternal benefits while living on, on this earth and in the heavenly realms. Don't be so quick to follow your desires and be destroyed by allowing Satan to tempt you in your selfishness. Be blessed by allowing the Holy Spirit to give you the power with the, wisdom, with the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment. Then your battle in the flesh will be conquered. Amen. I can say amen you know? to that. Yeah. And for to be carnally minded is death, yes. but to be spiritually it's minded life. is life and, and peace. peace. Romans 8, 6. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Amen. So I'd like to give this to you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, and, and I want to thank you so much for being on the show. But what I would also like for you to do is to be able to tell our viewers how they can be able to 
be forgiven for their sins, to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So can you be able oh, to close abs- in prayer? Absolutely. Let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer. Thank you. Uh, and this is one of my most important things that I could ever do is to share this. Sure. And if you're uh, out there listening right now, just bow your head in a word of prayer. And, and this is what I did back in 1983. I heard this message and it transformed and changed my life. I've never been the same. And that is that we must admit that we are sinners. And it doesn't matter if we're big sinners, little sinners, we're sinners. Unless we can keep the Ten Commandments, which no one can, we are sinners. And that is a problem, and it's, it separates us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we can never be in His presence. But God the Father made a way that someone can pay our debt, our sin debt, a debt that we can never pay ourselves. And I ask you out there, just to bow your head and just say, Father in heaven, forgive me, for I am a sinner, and I cannot save myself. No religion, no good works, no giving money to this charity or that, nothing can make me as good as you. So someone has to pay the penalty for my sin. Father, would Jesus Christ please save me die for me and I know that he has and rose again Lord I believe that he rose again after his death sacrificial death for my sins and I ask him to be Lord of my life my Savior my King my God and I give all that I am to him my heart my future my destiny uh, take me Lord and let me follow you Lord let me be a child of God through faith in your risen son and just pray that in Jesus name And then I just ask you that uh, you would just uh, seek out a good Bible-believing church, uh, one that preaches the Word of God, the true Word of God, with with no compromise, sometimes things that we don't want to hear, but the things we need to hear. Get into your Bible. Start off in the Gospel of John and start reading and watch what Christ will do in this life, but also, more importantly, in the life to come that you will be with him forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. And so thank you so much for being on my show. Okay. And, um, it's an honor. You, you know, I'm thank, thankful for your honesty and for sharing your, um, and to, you know, for sharing your story. And, and like I said, it was a tough topic. And, but it's good for people to hear. Well, it's a good way to launch your show, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. You I talk know. about sex, people are going to listen, right? I know, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, Pastor okay. Scott. I do appreciate okay. it. And I want to thank you so much, again, for joining me on my show. And again, my tagline, keep inspired blessings within arm's reach to help give you comfort when others are at a loss for words. Thank you, and God bless. To accept and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please say this prayer. I know that I am a sinner who needs forgiveness. Jesus, please forgive me for all my sins and purify me. I know that you died and rose again to pay for my sins. I need you to be my Lord and Savior for the rest of my life. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible.